So I am delighted to be joined here today by Rain Trozzi. And Rain has been working a lot for his dad, Dr. Mark Trozzi. Dr. Mark Trozzi, among other things, is on the steering committee of the World Council for Health. But Rain also has been working in a community group over to the youth. This actually gained quite a lot of an, uh, quite a lot of attention at the Better Way conference last year from the World Council for Health because it was just so inspiring for people in the room to see the youth engaged in creating a better way, creating a better world. And then more recently, Rain has now started a new project, Remnant Privacy, which we'll also get into as well. So first of all, thank you, Rain, for joining me today. Thank you, Rabito, for having me on your show. It's a privilege. My first question to everybody uh, when I do these interviews, because I think it's really inspiring for people that are watching these interviews at whatever stage they're at, from kind of realizing that things are not the way that they thought they were to maybe connecting those dots going into a bit of doom and gloom to reclaiming health and then focusing on how can I be of service is just if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit of a background about who you are, who Rain is, and also uh, when was your what I call the awakening, the realization that things are not the way that we think they are? Well, I, I actually grew up um, despite the accent, primarily in the UK, um, in the, the Southwest region. And I uh, attended school there from, um, from first year, year R, and then year one and so on. Um, and uh, I, had a, I had a rocky childhood, which I'm really blessed of because it, it gave me a lot of um, resilience. Um, and it also uh, made me feel more like a like an outsider from from an early age. So I, I wasn't ever really in the click group. Um, I often would walk around the school by myself and you know sit in the tree. Um, and there was there were certain events that ended up driving me to be very recluse. Um, so I'd start skipping school, stay home, and. At the time, it, it really seemed like a, a terrible thing to myself and those around me. But what I realized in hindsight was that in doing that, I actually insulated myself from a lot of the propaganda conditioning that the kids were getting in school. So bizarrely, between <laughs> being very antisocial and, um, and also video game addiction, I, I didn't go to school very much in those years. and so. I didn't pick up on the propaganda that the school was promoting, which which is nowhere near as bad as what it is these days. I feel terrible for the kids in the system now. And I, if I had a child, I wouldn't send them to school. Um, but anyway, I graduated uh, my GCSEs in England. And very quickly at this point, I, I mean, I wouldn't say I was at any awakened point, but what I was certainly aware of was like, whoa, you know, if I go to university, I'm basically putting my foot in a bear trap economically because I probably won't be able to get a job with the things that I'm interested in studying. Um, or at least I won't get a job that's applicable and I'll be paying off a lot of debt for the rest of my life. So I decided to become an electrician. And, um, and immediately after graduating, I went into an electrical apprenticeship, uh, which I really enjoyed the work and I had, I had a lot of good plans. But I was starting to see my own reality shifting very far away from other people's reality. And, and I was completely isolated in that. Um, and it was really from, uh, at the time, quite guiltily uh, discovering Paul Joseph Watson and watching his videos as like a 16 and a half year old. Um, and I took to talking with my dad over the phone about it because uh, he, he was in Canada and I was in um England and I was really surprised to hear like wait <laughs> you watch him too <laughs> um and so that really helped uh that helped me not feel so like ashamed of 
thinking Paul Joseph Watson was telling the truth, um, or at least pointing out some absurdities. And the more I got into that, the the harder it was to, for me to reintegrate into the world that I, you know, was participating in. And um, one day I woke up and I decided to quit my job and um, move to Canada to start again. Um, that's when I met my uncle Dave, who's one of the heroes in my journey. Um, so I, I got, I get off the plane and my uncle Dave, who I hadn't um, seen in many years, he comes and picks me up from the airport and, uh, and he, yeah, I think he's the one that gave me the red pill <laughs> and he ended up, um, introducing me to David Ike while I was staying at him and my grand, my grandpa's house. Um, and he showed me this eight hour David Ike awakened video before my dad arrived to pick me up. And by the time that video was over, I was, I was just there sitting in this chair, shaking and trembling. <laughs> um, and, and I, and I wouldn't say that everything stuck or everything resonated at the time, but this idea that we're in an information matrix, uh, that certainly stuck. And so I think that was when I awoken to the fact that I was unaware. That was the beginning for me, um, five years ago. So obviously, you know, your dad is involved in this um, movement to do with kind of the, the censorship of science that's been going on during COVID. W were you already aware when the whole COVID thing started rolling out that it was not, um, you know, that there was an agenda there? Certainly to an extent. I mean, both my dad and I and pretty much my whole family well, almost my whole family were really aware of geopolitics and had gone down different rabbit holes and things. And that included, um, and I really got to say thanks to, to Alex Jones, to be honest with you, because he called everything, um, him and Mike Adams. So there were, there were uh, essentially information prophets in my life, uh, not that I'd ever met, but those that I'd followed through the internet that called on this stuff not exactly as it would occur and i think it surprised everybody when it was actually happening because it, it changed from being a fiction to being a reality so we had a head start from the beginning i i actually decided not to pursue university which i'd come to canada to become an architect i decided not to do that because i had a strong feeling that they'd introduce some sort of vaccination that would be very lethal it was a really upsetting time actually because i'd 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 come to um well i'd left everything i knew in england i come to canada i i because i i've done a year of apprenticeship um in a trade i it wasn't an academic year i actually decided to go back a year so that i could do the academic stream in high school in case i wanted to go to university and i worked really hard to get high grades i ended up with a 91 average which for for a guy that was getting you know mid 70s um it took a lot of work and yeah they uprooted our lives and um and it was funny for me because I was I was so plugged into information at this time that I was the first one to fall for the whole pandemic and the masks i genuinely thought that there was a bioweapon that had been released from china <laughs> like week one i'm like oh <laughs> this is a lab leak and um and so i was wearing proper m95 masks and uh and i was i mean i was distancing from people especially in these first few weeks right I, I, like no one knew what was happening and um and i genuinely was worried for myself and others but there's this point of like, nobody's dead. Like the whole country shut down. I mean, <laughs> and weeks into it, nobody's dead. And I, I was calling my uncle Dave <laughs> every day because uh, yeah, he's the guru in my story. And uh, and I was just like, uh, Dave just talked to me more because he would. All, he was telling me, uh, Rain, it's. It's not a deadly virus. It's a joke, man. <laughs> they called it day one, but I, I just couldn't believe it. So I kept calling back because it was the, the truth I wanted to hear. 
um so yeah it, it was it was a head start it was a hyper reaction for me and then it was totally seeing everything all at once and going oh <laughs> there's something way worse on the horizon and it plays into what the likes of Mike Adams and Alex Jones have been warning about for, and David Icke have been warning about for years. So a very shaky way. That was, that was my COVID early COVID experience. Did that lead then to you working with your dad on the uh, Dr. Trozy.org or were you then, uh, you know, kind of at what point was the over to the youth? Over to the Youth was a was my second project. Um, so in 2020, my dad came out. I think he was the first Ontario doctor to come out, but he came out anonymously on Rebel News about, you know, the hospitals were empty. So he, he had he felt obliged to be honest about that. Um, that was a really scary time for our family. Like for me, I was very worried about my dad getting like killed if he were to be a whistleblower um and he was warning every patient in the hospital that he worked like you know like a hundred people a day he would he would close the door and he was under gag orders by the hospital he'd close the door and he'd like turn to the patient he says like you could take the mask off it's bullshit <laughs> and He'd treat them, but he'd also explain to them what was happening. So he he was in it from, you know, the very beginning to the full extent he could be. But it wasn't until December 2020 that we decided to go um, industrial with it. And because um, I stopped my studies, well, stopped uh, the next steps of my studies after they locked us down in my last semester of high school, um it was a lot easier to do my schoolwork by the way online so what i did was i started taking like billy jean marketing courses and I, I learned how to build websites and and um graphic design and how to edit a video and things like this so i've been building up this um portfolio of ragtag skills um for it and uh and then in, in that december 2020 my dad said to me he's like rain i got a i got a plan <laughs> and i need you to help me with it if it's gonna work and i and i was i was thinking i'm like oh yeah we're gonna like dig a bunker and buy canned beans <laughs> but then he says uh you know we're gonna blow the whistle and i'm like what <laughs> um okay <laughs> So we spent the next three months building the earliest form of the website and making the earliest videos. And we launched everything on March 1st, including a bunch of um, my dad did Rebel News interviews with David Menzies in studio. And then from that point on, it was for both of us, it was our full time job. I mean, I was constantly building up the website, upgrading it, editing videos. Um, doing graphic designs um and my dad was in that in that portion of war i war i mean he was he was pushing out a lot of content but also doing an extreme amount of research um very quickly i watched my dad become a like a, a world leading expert in the subject um and that kept going till present day i mean there's no plan to stop it until until this war is over um but it was january 2022 um that i met a new friend dr susan and um and i mean like absolutely delightful elderly lady very wise incredibly wise woman and a wonderful musician and we were playing um music together and having a good time um and then she all of a sudden like got very serious and she said to me rain there's a big issue 
in this world right now. And it's that your generation is almost completely unrepresented. And that hit me like, like, whoa, <laughs> I mean, that's true. Um, of all the people I follow, at least I, I can't think of anybody under 30. Um, maybe the youngest would be like Owen Shoyer from Infowars. That's, you know, it's the youngest sort of main classification of, of people I see participating in this story. And then she asked me, would you consider being a voice? And, and I, I actually laughed, like, not in a mocking way, but I, I, I laughed because um, I don't feel qualified. <laughs> and so what I said to her, I said, well, you know, I've been doing this background work this whole time, and it's been really effective, this, 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 this thing with my dad that I've been um, working on. So no, I, I wouldn't consider being a, a speaker or a, a face or whatever. And that lasted about a week because after that, the media started going after my dad. And, um, and that really brewed a new passion for me because I've become so IT literate. I really knew how to hurt these people um, if people did certain things collectively. And so I wrote... I wrote a guide, a beginner's guide for, I think it was called um, Beginner's Guide to End Big Tech Brainwashing. And we published that on my 21st birthday on drtrose.org. And it had, um, it was read over 8,000 times. And it, it got um, a little bit of, a little bit of media attention from, from a, you know, a, a new media platform, just a really nice guy uh, wrote about it. And for me, that was like the, that was the start of mission two, which was, okay, if I could do that, then there must be thousands of young people around the world that could probably do better. <laughs> so my, my goal became to create a community of people like myself, not, not like to be culty or to be a very small, small specific demographic because I really over to the youth, which was the name that had been in that article, <laughs> the guy that covered it, um, he, he titled it over to the youth. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh, that's the name. <laughs> and, um, and so I started building this, this new idea out. And then I was invited to speak in the better way at Bath, which really surprised me because up to this point, I'd done nothing but that one article publicly. Um, but nonetheless, the World Council for Health um, sponsored me to go to this event with my dad and to be one of the speakers on the third panel. Um, and it was such a blessing to have that experience of, of meeting people in this movement and connecting with um, such enlightened souls. I learned so much that week. <laughs> and, uh, and from that that um public exposure the first like 10 members poured in in such a small amount of time and that became my new like core friend group and um yeah since then over to the youth has kept going um we do a weekly sunday meeting so every week the members get together and uh we do all sorts of skills training for like things like how to maintain healthy boundaries, how to live a truer expression of ourselves. Um, we check in, we do this thing called a check-in where everybody takes a turn telling the, the whole group where they're at and, and really the goal is to go as deep as we, as we feel comfortable going. And I've seen this project like, and I've seen this community elevate my friends' lives, including mine, like having having kindred spirits around you. Um, I think that's really the main focus of Over to the Youth is to create a bastion of humanity for young people. I'm going to ask you to share the website links at the end, but it is overtotheyouth.com. 
uh, where you can find more information. Um, wow, it's an amazing journey that you've been on. Do you mind me asking you how old you are? Sure. Uh, I'm 22 years old. I was 22 last month, um, month of the day ago. <laughs> yeah time keeps moving forward so i'm 45 and if i imagine what i was doing at 22 you're on a uh on a different journey certainly so what is the uh the, the numbers now for over to the youth over to the youth has over 20 members in terms of our online following it's it's not very high i mean um we're only now starting to turn a corner because it's so it's been so experimental right so there's all the always this question of like okay how much do we put into you know producing content and things which would take away from the community side making a business out of it and then you know how much do we put into the well-being of our members and um connecting as a as a community and I always I always ping pong between these two until I fell onto the community side I'm like you know first and foremost the most important thing this is doing is is um nurturing these young adults in a pretty lonely world when you think about it there's not many people our age that think the way we think I'm sure you get asked this question a million times from uh, older, the older generations, but why do you feel that there are so few younger people today who are questioning what's going on? So since the Rockefeller, no, sorry, the Frankfurt schools of the 1940s, I believe, started infiltrating Western society, um, essentially every generation has been at least at least in you know if you step back and you look at the larger demographic there's individuals that are different but every generation into this has been deeper into the psyop so my generation is deeper into this than yours um yours yours has certainly been affected and we see that demographically with um with a percentage of people that are for one aware of what's going on and for two activated um and then we see the same trend following into my generation I, I dare say that your parental generation and my grandparental generation are the most active in this area maybe that that space between parental and grandparental um and that that makes up the, really the the numbers of everybody pushing for a better world right now through this lens. And so I, I really think it comes down to indoctrination and also a sense of like, what can we do? <laughs> I mean, um, I'm, I'm unusual in the sense of this is, this is my only purpose and focus in life. Um, I, I exclusively focus on, um, these missions of mine and that's odd because <laughs> most young people most 22 year olds uh are in university or they're working or they're um trying to pay the bills i i was very blessed with um for one a lucky head start but for two like by reducing our overheads my dad and I have been able to do this full-time with the support of our donors and we wouldn't be able to do it without them so yeah I'd say indoctrination I'd say maybe even chemical poisoning um and I'd also say just survival and maturity maturity is another one I mean a lot of a lot of especially guys my age are more interested in partying and clubbing and and um and having fun so there's so many things there's so many factors to that question yeah i think um as you were just described as you were going through your answer there if because we're born in a world where you know our parents you know generally the parents and um have been indoctrinated and their parents have been indoctrinated we have to go through this whole journey 
of peeling those onion layers away to realize who and what we truly are, which normally takes people until their 30s or mid 30s or 40s to do that. And so, yeah, I can resonate because I remember, you know, what I was like when I was 22. And the focus was studies and maybe girls and (laughs) and beer and yeah. But, um, But I know for me personally, I always, when I was growing up, I always felt like the world out there doesn't quite make sense. And I was always questioning things. And that, I think, separated me from my peers when I was at school, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just feel like there must be more people out there. Like there must be more than than we um, perceive uh, the youth that are feeling like something's not right and maybe looking for somewhere to go. And like you say, you mean, over to the youth is one option, but there's not a lot of big, you know, like big uh, um, known places that people can go to, except perhaps, I wonder what the demographic is for someone like Russell Brand or someone like that, you know, who's sharing a lot mm. of information or Joe Rogan. Yeah, I imagine those, those guys, I, I mean, I follow both of them um, and I have to say, their content appeals to me, like the way they cover things, the the character. I imagine that. I imagine they have more young people following them than we may know. So moving on to the uh, your latest project, you said you started it in uh, December last year. Uh, Remnant yeah. privacy. Yeah. First of all, would you like to just share a little bit about what that is? Oh, for sure. Well, I'm a big believer in freedom, but I believe that you can't have freedom without privacy. And I've seen many things coming on the horizon for for quite a few years, such as the surveillance state. I mean, there's so many cameras these days. There's facial recognition technology. That's why I got these glasses from reflecticals.com. They block facial recognition. Um, And also, I mean, even the intrusion of the fiat system that we have in place right now, like the amount of data collection that happens there, and then they're leveling it up into a CBDC. So for me, the build up to starting Remnant Privacy started in the same time period as when I started over to the youth, in fact, because at that same time of having that awakening, I also got into Bitcoin. And at first I was so skeptical about it because the lens through which I'd seen Bitcoin before and I'd played around with it before was like, I'd signed up on Coinbase. I'd scanned my face and I handed them my passport. And then I never actually had custodianship of it. And it was just constantly wanting more data and information. So I thought Bitcoin, I don't want anything to do with Bitcoin. If this is what Bitcoin is (laughs) Coinbase and all these exchanges. And, um, and it was during this December, 2021, and I met, a, I met a new friend, Steve, and he was explaining to me like, no, man, <laughs> you got Bitcoin all wrong. And um, and he explained to me how it really worked and how it was actually private freedom money. And I mean, I've made a full I've made a full course on a free course on remnant privacy about how to Bitcoin That's the title of it. And it explains, you know how it works why it's important how to use it how to buy it and all that and i mean in itself it's you know if if you if someone wants to learn bitcoin they need to dive into that subject with with commitment but um anyway i had this realization after this conversation and then meeting another um expert on the subject to explain more to me and then maybe like 500 hours of research and practice (laughs) i uh it really became a, a a really corner like a very important part of my intellectual focus was bitcoin and it became like it's, it's like a whole university subject in itself um and the earliest concept that steve introduced me to was that there was three levels to bitcoin comprehension and they tend to come sequentially and the first one was 
looking at it like a stock investment and a means of making more fiat money, which I mean, it's very low level understanding of Bitcoin because it's coming at it from like a, a fiat economy perspective. But then if you look at it from a technology perspective, well, first off, one would notice that it's literally freedom money. I mean, it's uncensorable digital cash that has no central controlling point and it's you know, it's basically owned by nobody and regulated by everybody on the network, which is over 100,000 nodes. So this is nothing like any financing that we've seen in our history. And it's it's money completely reinvented. And then thirdly, and this is the, this is the point I'm still tapping into this, but it was it was a philosophy that was above me where I was at. And now I'm starting to see it. And it's and it's the nature of Bitcoin is somewhat a template for us to follow in many other matters. I mean, it's a, it's an open and resilient protocol. It's, it's a deflationary currency. Um, it's a cybersecurity protocol because it's backed by proof of work. I mean, anything that we build with Bitcoin requires enormous amounts of energy to attack. Um, and uh, and if you look into how it's guiding energy saving, because a lot of people think, oh, Bitcoin's bad for the planet. But what a lot of Bitcoin miners are doing is they're bringing their portable Bitcoin mining trucks over to um, like oil rigs that have these fire burn offs that is just wasted energy going into the sky. And they talk to the guy. And, and the reason for that is there's no way to store those volatile gases long term and transport them safely. But what these Bitcoin miners are saying is, hey, can you uh, capture that energy for us and we'll buy it from you? <laughs> so they're harnessing the super cheap energy to mine Bitcoin because Bitcoin incentivizes um, the cheapest energy possible, which is actually typically either waste energy or green energy. So there's this, this huge Bitcoin bubble of thought and philosophy that's landed into my life over the last year. And, um, and I decided to get in on it because what I, what, I, what I saw, it was like, well, you know, I could buy Bitcoin all I want, but then I'm only really limiting myself to the, to the bottom level of like, oh, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a store of wealth or it's, or it's, uh, you know, a stock or whatever, like even conscious of those higher la layers, if, if I only did that, that's where I'd be. Um, so I started spending Bitcoin, like I, I started shopping for things with Bitcoin um, as much as I could. I For the month of January, I had a goal. I'm like, I'm going to spend in person, only cash in person and only Bitcoin online. And I did it for a month and I was so happy about that. Um, but anyway, in November, I decided that actually I want to, I want Bitcoin as my income stream. And that's very hard to do because not a lot of people are even in, in the movement. Not a lot of people are Bitcoin savvy. A lot of people are worried about Bitcoin because they confuse it with CBDCs and, um, and I mean, it's, it's advanced IT in a way. So I think that's definitely a challenge ahead of me, like actually transitioning onto a Bitcoin income. But once I'm there, then no, no government or bank can shut me up or shut me down. Um, I mean, obviously doing everything fairly outside of the system means what system am I going to be paying tax to? Certainly not the ones that <laughs> drop bombs on the Middle East. Um, probably if any, right? And uh, and also like privacy, like I don't want to, I don't want the bank knowing, you know, everything I buy, even though, yeah, I've got nothing to hide, but you know, we all have everything to hide because if we just feed our information into the surveillance state, the surveillance state becomes um, more powerful. So remnant privacy, we do de-Googled phones, We've got a DIY de-googled phone guide and we supply OEM unlockable phones for that purpose. Um, so that's our whole ghost phone project. We've got our Bitcoin course. Um, 
we've got we we do a a blog um so right we write mostly on like bitcoin and privacy and a bit of it and um we also we also supply raspberry pis for people that want to do their own it projects or build a bitcoin up so that's that's remnant privacy yeah I imagine the blog can also be kind of almost your learning experience as you keep going to the next level of, as you were saying, you know, first of all, it's a way to to buy and sell. And then I forget the second stage, the final one being it's it's a, it's an it's almost like a model for the wider system. What was the second stage again? Sorry. Freedom money. I think the most important is it's freedom the most money. Important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually haven't started using Bitcoin yet. I'm going to create a wallet and uh, I am going to start experimenting. And the other thing you were talking about is the tax side of things. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there now. I just interviewed someone about this as well, about, you know, common law and how to how to start looking at where you want to step out of the system uh and also interestingly he was talking about how which i also agree with you know you can use the old system to your own advantage while we transition into the new because what he was saying was there's many people that have sent in their birth certificates and you know like totally deregistered and the consequence of that is you can't get a passport anymore so Mm. that stops your freedom and then the other uh the other one is you can end up in prison which certainly is not freedom so you know you need to be careful so what he was saying was you know that you can you can take all of this you know the bitcoin and the common law and all of this and now is a great time to 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 jump in and to start learning and to start Mm -hmm. experimenting as we transition and uh so that's also what I feel uh, very much motivated to do. It sounds like you're ahead of me, but uh, well, you are definitely ahead of me. Oh, in some areas, but in other ways, I'm completely ignorant. <laughs> but we all are, right? And I think that's the beautiful thing is that we can learn from each other. And um, what I've learned recently is the difference between having a wallet, you know, where your money is still owned or not owned, but you're stored uh somewhere else and then you can actually have your own wallet Uh, i don't know all the terminology but you can then kind of you can travel around and as long as you remember your key whatever the the, the the seed phrase yeah seed phrase yeah the seed phrase you can then plug in in any device anywhere in the world and your money is always there so it's a fascinating topic i feel that a lot of people uh well there's two things one of them is it's I think fear of the unknown, because it's really something that you've got to forget about the old system and start looking at something completely new, Uh, you know, which is for, for me, it's okay. I, I enjoy technology, but you know, for some people in the older generations, that's probably quite scary. But the other thing is you hear quite a lot, perhaps you could comment on this one where people say, you know, that, um, you know, governments or the deep state or whatever, they'll they'll just co-opt Bitcoin in the end. So it's not like other things where they could just buy up billions and billions and billions of dollars of stocks all in a flash, right? Um, Bitcoin is made, well, it's mined and mining essentially means there's all these computers around the world that are um responsible for the security protocol of the network called time stamping which stops double spending so it's a necessary security protocol and they incentivize that because it takes energy satoshi nakamoto incentivized that by building in a reward system to the bitcoin mining um and basically what it is is there's a regulated difficulty level to keep this process around 10 minutes because we were aiming for 10 minute timestamps. And, um, and in this 10 minutes, there's a new Bitcoin key that's created. Currently it's like 6.25 Bitcoin for in, in these keys created every 10 minutes. 
And um, every computer involved in this around the world is guessing to break what's called a, a SHA-256 encryption, which is the only way to break it is to like continuously guess what the answer is. There's no way to de-encrypt it. You have to guess until you get the right combination. Um, am I right anyway. in thinking, sorry, am I right in thinking that if some, you know, if some government or whatever wanted to kind of crack it, that they'd have to guess the combination in 10 minutes and then it would change again. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll move right into a 51% attack and explain that. But the first point is that because Bitcoin, and then you could also get into halving cycles. So Bitcoin is issued over the years in a reverse logarithmic um, type way. So in the first days of Bitcoin, there was a lot more Bitcoin issued every 10 minutes. And then four years later, there was half as much. The reward was cut in half. Four years later, cut in half. Four years, and it'll continue like that for the next like 110, 120 odd years until the last Bitcoin is mined. So the thing is, is that there's a limited supply. It's literally scarce and people around the world hold these. And yeah, there's billionaires that have a lot of it. But the thing is, is like Bill Gates can't just come in and buy all of it. Um, now, if, if we look at the cybersecurity of Bitcoin, essentially the more energy the Bitcoin network uses, the more secure it is. And the reason for that is in order to, to, for somebody to just double spend their own Bitcoin, they would need to, um, they would need to continuously win the race basically so that they controlled the timestamp and then they could double spend their own money. Um, but the thing with that right now is that they would need the entire energy infrastructure of Brazil in order to do a standard attack on the Bitcoin network, which wouldn't involve stealing other people's Bitcoin. It would be spending theirs continually without it ever leaving their account. But again, they would need more than Brazil's total energy infrastructure to do that. I mean, for them to spend the entire energy of Brazil to achieve what? To be able to then... Spend their own Bitcoin more than once. So really, there's not much that they can do with Bitcoin. You know, the, the those at the top of the archaic pyramid structure, because, you know, the, the ultimate achievement, you know, the, the most that they could achieve is that they would be able to spend Bitcoin more than once. They couldn't uh, take your Bitcoin away, for example. I or think the worst, the or worst close they your account. Do. No, they, they can't they can't really do anything to people that are following good practices. I mean, there's all sorts of intrusive KYC on ramps to Bitcoin. Um, there's definitely ways around them, but a lot of people will get snagged on that. And then the idea is the surveillance state knows you have X amount of Bitcoin. So I'd say that's the biggest problem. The threats are the on ramps, the KYC on ramps. Um, the user's own reckless spending, like, you know, mixing their anonymous coins with public coins or tagging their identity when they buy something, for instance. And um, gosh, we've opened the Bitcoin box. My brain, my brain goes off in a hundred different directions. It is a big question for people, just how safe is it for the, or yeah, how safe is it for for people to to go into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and also, you know, how the, measuring up the the time it's going to take to start exploring it and to create your first wallet and to make oh. your first purchase versus um, hoping that see <laughs> that uh, central bank digital currency will never happen. Obviously. Uh, for me, I want to go into this. I want to start exploring it. But um, as you said before earlier, you know, there are people that kind of make excuses. And I feel that the excuses from what from the little that I understand about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency come more from the fact that it's a little bit scary to start getting involved in this than real reasons why somebody shouldn't. 
is basically what I was getting at. Yeah, I definitely found the same thing when I began exploring it. And and I went, uh, goodness, I went down so many rabbit holes with it. And it was, I, I had, I didn't really have a guide in the early days to show me the way. I was really just churning through information and trying to wrap my head around these concepts that I didn't quite understand. Um. But actually, what my friend Steve pointed out to me is like, Rain, you're in a great position to explain this to people once you figure it out. Because a lot of the Bitcoiners that have been in this for years, they're so far ahead that they forgot the questions they had at the beginning. So I, I, I started reaching the very edge, you know, where, where the beginner becomes, you know, the, the intermediate. And I turned around and I was like, I better make a very concise guide on everything that I've learned so that someone can learn all of this in under four hours, you know, <laughs> maybe under three, depending if you watch all the videos. And so I put together how to Bitcoin, which was, which is a collection of all of the best material that I came across on my journey, put together in an order that makes sense. Um, so it's a very concise guide for people that are, ready to level up and learn how to use this this technology that's really like really fantastic for people as you said who are appre apprehensive and not sure exactly how to start and as i said to you before we started recording this let's get this content on cpn as well so that people can start checking out these this guide and these different articles and blog posts and things because I think that this is definitely part of the solution. And even if Bitcoin isn't the solution as far as currency goes, knowing how to use it and knowing how to use cryptocurrency, you know, because things change organically, is going to be so useful. And so maybe Bitcoin won't be the cryptocurrency, but uh, it, it's definitely going to be one of them that's going to be uh, part of, I would imagine, future trade and future exchange. Yeah, in my opinion, in terms of cryptocurrency, I mean, I'm, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I don't believe any other cryptocurrency is worthwhile. Um, there's use cases for sure with like USD stable coins and such. Um, I think Ethereum has turned into a complete waste of time since they've moved to proof of stake, which is essentially people that have the most Ethereum decide what happens on the Ethereum network and can blacklist other verifiers based on their consensus vote. <laughs> um, I mean, Monero, potentially Bitcoin and Monero. But again, I, I haven't thoroughly learned Monero because I'm still learning Bitcoin. What we're going to find is that all of the other cryptocurrencies are going to fall off very quickly because a lot of them are pump and dump projects where the creators just want to make a lot of money very fast. And a lot of people buy into them because they like the name or they think other people are going to buy it. And, and the, whole, the whole motivation behind other cryptocurrencies is, is the idea of making lots of fiat money. <laughs> so... It's missing the point. And, and also that that judgment day for that entire area is coming because during the COVID area, there was a huge buy bubble because people getting were free stimulus money and they're staying home. So everyone became a stock trader <laughs> and everybody was thinking, oh, cryptocurrency is a stock. So, you know, there's this there's this perplexed element in society where they're like, oh, cryptocurrency is terrible. Look how much money I lost doing this. I'm like, well, of course, you got you, you got into a buy bubble and you thought it was going to keep going up. <laughs> um, but I think Bitcoin's really different. But um, going back to something you said in terms of, you know, the solution, I don't think Bitcoin is the solution. I think it's a solution in, an, in, in a collection of necessary solutions. I mean, I'm going to be completely honest. If there was a nuclear war, if there was an EMP attack, if there was, um, you know, a food supply breakdown, Bitcoin probably won't be very valuable anyway. Um, if society survives and our energy infrastructure survives and our telecommunications infrastructure survives, Bitcoin is 
the future of global financing. Um, but I, I really think sovereignty is the collective solution. We need to look at sovereignty in terms of our food, water, shelter, heat, money. Bitcoin certainly helps with that, as does like gold and other stable forms of physical stores of wealth. Um, yeah, I often feel I often feel like people get caught up with the Bitcoin topic as if um, someone like myself is saying Bitcoin is all we need to solve all the world's problems. Like, no, it's certainly going to be helpful, but <laughs> it's one of many solutions that need to take place. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention John Bush, who's uh, one of the co-founders of the Greater Reset and the Freedom Cell Network. And he's very pro uh, Bitcoin and Monero, you mentioned Monero, but uh, he said that if there's like a nuclear meltdown or, you know, if uh, um, there's no more food or anything like that, you're not going to be, you're not going to be worried about Bitcoin anymore anyway. <laughs> you're going to have different priorities. So what's the point of, you know, not getting involved in it because of a possible cat catastrophic worst case scenario, Armageddon scenario? that might not happen because if that happens, we're all going to have different priorities anyway. And I quite like that answer because you can use those types of um, scenarios as an excuse to not get involved in the potential solutions that are available to us right now. Um, Rain, thank you so much. I'm sorry if uh, we, we dived a bit deep into the Bitcoin thing, but for me, it's quite interesting because I'm oh, still it's learning. All absolute about pleasure for me i love talking about bitcoin it's like it always makes my day when someone wants to talk about bitcoin <laughs> what i'd like to ask you just to kind of come towards the end now of this interview is people that are watching this that uh well maybe also for you it could also be people that are the younger generation so if there is somebody watching this that's you know in their 20s or something and they're looking around and they feel like all their friends are on a completely different wavelength to them and they feel kind of uh, left out. But also anybody who is going through just a struggling process right now, so just struggling with this whole thing that's going on in the world, uh, what advice would you give to people? What would be your, your advice to kind of help people out? Well, to the, to the young people, I mean, if you feel on feeling isolated, um, even, even lonely in the company of those that you know, definitely can understand that feeling. And, um, and I mean, certainly welcome to join, join our club at Over to the Youth. In the general sense, goodness. Um, I'd say swimming. <laughs> um, at least for me, uh i had days when my mind is just going absolutely nuts and um there's 101 bad things happening every day i mean from this dioxin plume to the rising likelihood of nuclear war with russia and china to our food systems shutting down and running out of diesel and rising prices of everything when i'm living either too far ahead of myself or too far behind i'm either living in fear of what's coming or i'm living in regret of what's been and both of those don't actually exist right they're just a figment of my own imagination and so it's all about coming back to the present moment and um and I stray from this all the time, so I'm not preaching from a from a from a pedestal here. <laughs> I say, yeah, I struggle with this, but coming back into the present moment, to the breath, to the to the senses, to the pre sense of the present moment, and um, for me, swimming is an exercise that drills that into me. It's like going for a battery refill on my soul, because swimming forces you to really focus on your breath on your technique on your stroke on the sensation of your body because like having water move quickly like past and around you like everything is being woken up and it's a, it's a feeling of being completely alive and so when i'm swimming um 
yeah, at first I'll think about all the stuff that was on my mind, but so quickly it just cleans it up, cleans up the mess. And then I'm just there. And from that space of being completely present, I find solutions for all my problems. When I'm not present, I just, you know, sit in a pit of all my problems. <laughs> so I'd say present and, uh, and at least my way of doing that is getting in a pool, river, lake, or ocean. Wow, thank you so much. I've actually started swimming. <laughs> for, for real? For, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, um, I mean, I've been doing meditation for a long time, but there's a swimming pool right next to me. And uh, I thought, you know, what can I do when I've been on the computer for an hour and a half or two hours and I just really need to just go and take some time and be and swimming was what I decided to do. So, and also, as you said, you know, yeah. And also you said that, you know, when you, once you get into that present moment, you find the solution to all your problems. It's a repeated theme throughout every interview that I'm doing. When I ask people, what would your advice be? Is that in the present, we get a connection to, I call it intuition. There's lots of different words for it, but that presence is uh, where we're kind of where we can feel the answers, where we can feel what we need to do. And um, and I also say to people that are worried about the future, that uh, if you can follow your intuition, if you can connect to your intuition, then everything will be OK as long as you do that and don't get too lost in the headspace. Oh, beautiful. Okay, Rain, so thank you so much for this interview. It was really, really nice. Um, I'm going to share all the links in the description, but would you, would you just like to share with people the links to the websites where people can find you and find your dad and find your projects? Yeah, and first of all, Rabita, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you today and with your audience. Um, truly, absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, so... Um, my projects and, and websites include over to the youth.com, remnantprivacy.com, <laughs> and drtrozzi.org. So that's Dr. T R O Z Z I.org. Great. Thank you so much. It also shows the age because the older people, when I ask the older people, people my age, when I ask them for their websites, they go www. <laughs> you don't need to say that anymore. <laughs> <It'll> redirect. <laughs> now it's now it's https colon dash dash. <laughs> Good old SSL encryption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Ray. Thank you so much for this interview. I look forward to you know how our collaboration is going to kind of continue moving forward. And thank you so much for talking with me today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you too.